I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm no stranger to uh, the FCNL, but I'm also no stranger to, uh, to this hotel. Um, and it's the first time actually I've been here uh, since 1980. Uh, in 1979, we had our first big uh, Palestine Human Rights Campaign um, convention. And there were uh, 650 people in this room all the way back. And it was an extraordinary time because um, we had um, Walter Fontroy and uh, Joe Lowry from uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference who had just come back from meeting Yasser Arafat in Beirut. It was in the aftermath of the Andy Young being fired at the UN for daring to speak to the PLO. Um, and then we also had Jesse Jackson who was on his way to uh, Beirut. Uh, we had an extraordinary collection of uh, uh, Palestinian leaders and, uh, um, and Israeli uh, peace activists uh, and seven members of Congress, uh, that, which is sort of hard to come by these days on, on this <laughs> issue. Uh, the um, couple things I remember about event, that event were we had 650 people at the banquet, and it was big. And uh, we were pretty proud of ourselves. We were on um, NBC Evening News three nights in a row. And we were on um, CBS once, ABC once, front page in the uh, old Washington Star. Do you remember that? Really old. We're all old. <laughs> and, um, uh, and front page in the Christian Science Monitor when it was a real big paper, and the uh, Washington Post did something, and the New York Times did something, and it was a big story. We actually so proud we collected all the press in a 24-page booklet, and in the Jewish Press, which is the paper that the Kahan folks published in Brooklyn back then, they still still published, but it's uh, sort of not quite what it was, um, had a headline with what we call New York Daily News uh, headlines, like that, you know, banner stuff, Secret PLO Meet Plots Terror. <laughs> and um, I thought, wow, secret, shoot. I mean, we were doing our darndest to get coverage for this, <laughs> this thing. Our cover's been blown. Um, and, um, uh, and sure enough, a couple months later, our office got firebombed. Um, and so I remember that pretty well. And the, just as long as I sort of, sort of, just going off, my daughter would be in the back and I was like, shut up, shut up. <laughs> the, the, no, while I'm, while I'm reminiscing a bit, the thing I remember about the firebombing was um, we had a, uh, a newborn and uh, I hadn't been getting much sleep, but we had decided, my wife uh, and I had decided we were staying in Washington. I was, had been teaching at a state college in Pennsylvania and every year I'd take a leave of absence and another leave of absence and finally, this is the third year, going on the fourth year and I said, I'm not going back. So we said, okay, we're gonna tell them we're leaving. And I moved everything down, including my dissertation files. I'm a pack rat. And so all of my papers, because um, I had gone to the refugee camps and collected stories of the refugees and uh, made maps of the houses where they were in the camps and everything. And it was stuff I wanted to keep, you know? And, and so I, I, uh, because it was the time of the Israeli, the boycott, the Arab boycott of anybody doing business with Israel. There were no Xerox machines in the Arab world. Therefore, like a medieval monk, I was in the libraries hand copying everything that I needed to use. Um, and so I had these boxes I moved in into my office on 1322 um, uh, 18th Street, uh, right, right, up, right around the corner actually, just a few blocks away. and. Um, I got a call from WTOP radio at seven in the morning, not having had much sleep. And, and he, in his Columbia School of Broadcasting voice, uh, said, hello, is this Dr. James Ogby from the Palestine Human? I said, yeah. And, and he said, uh, do you have an office at 1322? And I said, yeah. And he said, um, um, you were, your office was firebombed this morning. And all I could think of was, and I said, Oh no, all my dissertation files. <laughs> and every damn hour on the hour, it began 
There was a fire this morning of suspicious origins at the office of the Palestine. We talked to the executive director, James Zogby, who said, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, it was mortifying, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Um, but I, 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 I learned some lessons back then, and uh, I've stayed with it. Sometimes I describe this work as Sisyphus. Um, but um, it's Sisyphus with a smile, because uh, there's almost no way to wake up in the morning and not want to roll that stone, because it's what we do. I mean, it's, it's the, you can't look at it and not want to roll it, because it, it sort of personally challenges you to, to respond. Um, and you get a little stronger every time you do it, and you feel just as good about it, even though you know it's going to roll back down. But, but you keep doing it because it's, it's, it's sort of the weird chemistry of kind of who we are. And I think we make a difference. Uh, I, I had one on my television show last night, uh, Nabil Shop, uh, the, who was the, one of the main architects at Oslo, and he had been on my television show three days after the signing ceremony in Oslo. And uh, so I asked him, did he ever think 18 years ago that we'd be where we are today? Um, and he, of course, said no, that they had tremendous hope then. And that hope has subsided. But what is so important, I think, is as they outline the strategy of where they are going now, because they have one. And sometimes it's tough for folks to discern and I think they need to be encouraged in, in what they're doing. Um, it's going to be painful for us as Americans to watch this strategy. But it's, it's, it's one that, that works. They have found violence does not work. They know violence doesn't work. It hasn't moved them closer to the goal. It's taken them further away from the goal. In, in fact, when it's used, it plays into the Israeli narrative and destroys the Palestinian narrative. One. Uh, very powerful personal lesson that I got was a, uh, years ago, a person I had done my dissertation on, Taufik Zayed, who was one of the poets of Palestine. He was a mayor of Nazareth and a member of the Israeli Knesset and an extraordinary fellow, um, just a jovial, um, wonderful sort of, almost like a, in a, if he had been an immigrant to America, he'd be a funny longshoreman, uh, just a muscle-bound, very gruff, but very fun guy, and um, I took him, I brought him here to the States, and um, I, two things happened on the, the one trip that we, we were here on was he had criticized armed struggle, um, as it was called, and, uh, and so was in turn being criticized by people in the Palestinian community. And uh, so at one of the events, somebody stood up in the audience and challenged him, you criticized our right to, to use armed struggle. And even the United Nations gives us the right of people under occupation to use armed resistance to struggle. And Taufik, quick as a whip, just looked back at him and he said, it's right. You have the right to armed struggle. But people who use it as damn badly as you do forfeit the right. <laughs> and, um, that sort of shut that argument down. A little while later, we had gone to an event sponsored by the United Holy Land Fund, which is still around. It's a charity, not a very large one, but it supports mainly Fatah-based institutions in the West Bank um, and Gaza. And uh, they do a lot of fundraising here in the States. Um, and they had, it was a folkloric event. And at one point in, in the evening, a um, young group of young kids came out to dance and they were, um, seven, eight, nine, ten, but the girls were dressed in Palestinian dress and the boys were dressed in khakis um, doing debki and they were carrying these wooden guns. And uh, he began to tear up and he said, I thought this was about our culture. He said, this is not our culture. This is what they've made us into. This is not who we are. And if this is what we celebrate, he said, our cause is gone. Well, I'm pleased to say that I think that that fixation um, is, is ending. Um, and a nif different mindset has taken hold. 
there is nonviolent struggle in the West Bank in particular, and it's quite significant. It doesn't get press attention, um, but Palestinians are aware of it in many little ways. It is taking place um, and needs to be enhanced. And, and what has occurred now is a four-pronged strategy that Palestinians have developed. And I think they need to be encouraged in, in every one of the four. And the first part of that is, is national reconciliation. Um, there, is no, there is no possibility of moving forward unless Fatah and Hamas come to an agreement. And uh, these are not good guys. Actually, they've, you know, both sides got their problems. Um, but if they don't find a way to achieve national reconciliation, there's not going to be any moving forward. Um, in part, you can't have a Palestinian state in one part of, 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 of Palestine and the other part remain under siege. The, the ties that bind this people are too close. And so there needs to be a way that they reconcile with each other. And in addition, there's no way you have a Palestinian solution in just Palestine. There are, as you met in Jordan, millions of refugees. They are a fundamental part of this people. And, and Israel, from the beginning, wanted to maintain that this was just about the refusal of Palestinians to recognize Israel's right to exist, but it is also Israel's refusal to recognize the right of Palestinian to peoplehood. And Palestinian peoplehood includes those Palestinians who are refugees, who I lived with the first time in 1971, old ladies with keys around their necks, uh, pictures of their homes and memorabilia from the house they left that they would love to go back to and know they probably never will, but have the right to return. We can't deny that reality. I mean, I had a friend in college, he was sort of a funny guy from New York, and when he'd get upset, people would say, don't get upset. And he'd say, I'm human. I have the right to emote if I want to. Um, <laughs> and and, and the, the fact is, is that you know, as we have, as Americans, understood this issue, we've seen it through the prism of one people versus a problem, not as a people versus a people. And the, the, the difficulty of not understanding these two very complex narratives that either need to be reconciled, and if not, at least need both to be understood and accepted as real, coming from real people. If, if, if the Jewish people have the right to define themselves in terms of pogroms and suffering and anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, Palestinians have the equal right to define themselves in terms of uh, dismemberment and displacement and exile. And so you cannot, as Israel tried from the very beginning of the occupation, to say, OK, we'll make peace with the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and set up basically what they wanted to do was set up reservations. And, and, and every time they come close to a state, what they actually mean is autonomy, basically self-rule within the territory, but none, nobody else gets included. And you simply can't do what they used to call back in the old days the village leagues. They wanted to set up little autonomous territories in the occupied territories, but no Palestinian elsewhere had any right to participate. That can't work. And so reconciliation means that the entire people have to be recognized and understood as a people. And that brings together the factions, and they need to be understood as that. Um, the second part of the strategy is... Um, uh, is the institution building process that is underway. And uh, they don't have a state. And I remember at one time testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and Dianne Feinstein said to me, she said, why can't Arafat act more like Mandela? Why can't he act more like Boris Yeltsin? And my response was, when they took over, they inherited states. They inherited all of the trappings of statehood, including the power of the state. They control their own economies. They control their own governance. They had ministries that were functioning that they took over from those who had been in power before, and they operated them. Arafat got the name Palestinian Authority without any authority. Didn't control borders. Didn't control resources. 
couldn't build an economy because you can't import or export. They say the Palestinian economy is on the increase. It is because foreign aid is increasing. It is an international aid dependent economy. That's where the money comes from. There are no jobs being created in Palestine because you can't import and export. I did that work with Vice President Gore in the 90s to build the economy in the West Bank and Gaza. We brought companies there, but they wouldn't set up their businesses because you couldn't bring raw material in and export product out. And the market is too small within to allow for any growth or development of anything beyond a, a local aspirin factory that produces aspirin for Ramallah and one in... See, you can't even export... or you can't even. Uh, uh, trade within the territories because you can't go from one part to the other. So you're basically talking about markets of a few hundred thousand people, which it's not a sustainable situation. And so they didn't have that and they still don't have that, but instead of whining about it, what Salam Fayyad has decided to do is build uh, a sort of a Potemkin state. The structures of a state, the functioning structures of a state, so that if they get statehood, they're, they're off and running. And the, the third part of it um, is, the nonviolent, is the nonviolent struggle, which is real. I, I mentioned that, uh, and, I, and it, it needs to be supported in so many ways. The fourth part of it is what's happening right now. It's the UNESCO uh, situation. It's the UN bid. It's the the 16 other international agencies that they will try to join. And they know it's not going to bring them closer to statehood. But they also know that what it does, as nonviolent struggle always does, is sharpen contradictions. And it is a lever that they can use, nonviolent diplomatic lever that they can use to sharpen the debate. Now what's, what's so troubling, I think, to many of us here, is listening to how Congress and the White House reacted to what they did. The letter from Congress was, stop the dangerous Palestinian gambit. Dangerous? What was dangerous about? Dangerous is bombs. Dangerous isn't saying vote for us as a state. Unilateral? What was unilateral about asking a hundred and something nations to vote for you? <laughs> um, and and when, before they did it, State Department brought in Microsoft and Google and, and, and all of the big major exporters and said, if they do this, we're going to cut funds to UNESCO. And if we cut funds to UNESCO, one of the things UNESCO does is protect intellectual property rights. And we're not, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. And so your export ability is going to suffer. And, and, and it's going to happen. And it's the Palestinians' fault. And so it is this classic blaming the victim for a law we passed back in 1994 that we never should have passed, because I was here then. Jim, you were here then when that all happened. I mean, what happened was the Palestinians signed the, the Oslo agreements. They came to the White House lawn. And everybody thought all of the anti-Palestinian legislation from the, the 80s would be rescinded. But instead, Likud began a campaign working with Republicans and weak-kneed Democrats in Congress to stiffen the requirements on Palestinians. It got so bad at one point that Yitzhak Rabin came to town and met with AIPAC and said, stop meddling. You are making peace more difficult for me because I can sanction the Palestinians if I need to. We're negotiating with them. We don't need you picking on them while we're trying to negotiate with them. AIPAC didn't listen, especially after Republicans won in 94, and then by 95 you had a whole series of legislative th actions, including the Jerusalem bill and a whole bunch of others, that simply made the situation worse. And so we, we weren't the honest broker. We became the cheerleader and the coat holder for the one side. And, and so when, when, when I hear people in the administration say, we have no choice, we're forced to cut this fund, you're not forced to do anything. You're forced to do it because you put yourself in this situation. You made this situation. You can undo this situation. And it is basically political cowardice that says we won't go to Congress and say rescind that law because that law never should have happened in the first place. Bill Clinton opposed it back then but didn't veto it because it was a veto-proof majority. 
And so accepting as divinely ordained the fact that any organization the Palestinians join, the US has to pull out and suspend its funding for is nonsense. That's not a commandment. I've read the Bible upside down, <laughs> inside out. I don't find it anywhere. It, we tied our own hands, and then we said our hands are tied. But we still have one free enough to pull the knot and undo it, but we're unwilling to do it. And Palestinians know that, and what they know is that if they can increase the pressure by creating a situation where the US shows itself to be less and less capable of producing peace, then maybe they can either create a change in the debate here or get Europe, as Sarkozy did at the UN, saying, it, it's time for this not to be the property of one country anymore. Maybe more people got to get involved in this thing. But all of this is part of a strategic approach, which I actually think is the first clever thing Palestinians have done in a very long time. <laughs> And I, and I mean that respectfully and not so respectfully, because they've made some bonehead moves over the years. But this one, I think, makes sense and should be supported. Um, but it is not understood here at all, because basically we can't understand anything but ourselves. And, and that's one of the real problems, of, of I think, of our diplomacy. We understand Israeli, Israeli problems. We understand Netanyahu's got a coalition, he's got a, da, 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 we, we get all that. We don't get Palestinians having politics. We don't understand Palestinians facing internal pressures. We don't understand the fact that they have a narrative that needs to be respected and, and, uh, um, and reconciled with the Israeli one. And as long as that's the case, this process goes nowhere. And it is the challenge, I think, of our time to deal with this. Um, in part because, as the president himself understood in a, in a very, I think, important passage in the speech he gave to AIPAC in May, he said there was a time when Israel could make peace with an Arab leader. It cannot anymore. What the Arab Spring has done, and I'm not here selling books. My book is called Arab Voices, but by, <laughs> by, by the way, uh, yeah, by the way, um, it has made Arab voices matter. It's actually helped my sales, too. But it's made Arab voices matter in the sense that not only does America need to start listening to what Arabs are saying, but Arab leaders themselves have to start listening to what Arabs are saying in their own countries. It was interesting. We just did a poll. Um, if we polled on these issues uh, every two years since 2001. And the question, we asked 10 political, 11 political priorities and asked people to to, to tell us how important each of them are, and then we rank them. And invariably, what we get as the top ranked issues are um, uh, employment and health care and education. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's because they're people. And uh, they, they, they actually go to bed at night. And they, you know, the myth in America is they go to bed at night hating America, wake up hating Israel, and spend the day in the mosque getting the hatred fueled or when they're at home watching Al Jazeera and hating even more. But actually, they go to bed at night thinking about their jobs, wake up in the morning thinking about their kids, and spend the day worried about their health care. I mean, that's, that's their people. And when they watch television, they watch movies and soap operas and things to entertain themselves. And that's life. I mean, they're living life is what they do. But what was different in this poll was that issues involving um, corruption and nepotism issues involving political reform and civil rights crept. In some places, didn't even creep. They just leapt up into the top three or four issues of concern. The Arab Spring has had an effect everywhere. And people are starting to think about things. I said to a reporter who asked me when Mubarak was on the ropes, she said to me, an NPR reporter said, if we, if we dumped Mubarak, would our standing go up in Egypt? And I said, you got it backwards. We're not unpopular in Egypt because we support Mubarak. He's unpopular in Egypt because he supports us. Because <laughs> he supported us in Gaza when Israel was mauling it and keeping it closed. And he supported us in Iraq. And he became a way station on the road to rendition. And he tortured people at our behest. And his people knew that. And the worse we made it, the more pressure we put on countries that were allied with us, the more repressive they came, became in order to squash 
internal dissent. Remember, Anwar Sadat was assassinated because of Camp David, because it was unpopular and Egyptians felt betrayed that he had pulled out. Because remember, right after Camp David was signed, Israel did its first major incursion into Lebanon because their southern border was now free and they didn't have to worry about a war. And the occupation of Lebanon began in 79, not 82. It was expanded in 82. And I remember Sadat had 24,000 people in prison at the time he signed Camp David. And a Palestinian was asked, would he agree to join? He said, we don't have prisons big enough to join Camp David like Sadat did. We couldn't put all of our people in prison who opposed if we made a separate deal without considering all of the rights of our people. Um, but that isn't the case anymore, and it won't be the case anymore. There will be pressure from down below saying, this isn't just, this isn't working, this is betraying our values and our principles. They're going to be as res have, have to be as responsive to their people as, as, as we are to ours and as the Israelis are to theirs. And that adds a complication in the equation of how diplomacy will work. Um, and a, a, a final observation uh, about the Arab Spring. It's not going to be pretty. And I think we have to understand that. And I, I, I remind audiences all the time when they, they say, that it's not pretty. Um, I think pretty is Tunisia. Uh, it's going fairly well. But there's a, a culture in Tunisia, a political culture in Tunisia, that is really quite different. It took us generations. And remember, within the few decades after the American Revolution, there were rebellions everywhere in the country against the colonialists who we call the founding fathers, who were imposing on masses, uh, governance and taxation that they found as reprehensible as the early rebels felt with the taxation that came from the British. It wasn't pretty. And it's still not pretty <laughs> in many ways, right? I mean, in terms of what we're still struggling with, it's a process that moves towards perfection but is never perfect. So, I, you know, look, we, we've, we've got to be concerned about what happens in several of these countries, but with cutting them a little bit of slack and just a touch of humility. I mean, they still, we're not the city on the hill anymore, the shining city on the hill. We're Abu Ghraib, and we're Guantanamo, and we're Iraq, and we're Gaza, and we are seen in a way that we don't like to see ourselves, but would that we could see ourselves as others see us and we'd understand that when, when, when John McCain goes over and starts pontificating about America's leadership, we're not there anymore. Our favorable ratings in the Arab world today are lower than they were in the last year of the Bush administration. Lower. And the reason why is because they had tripled in some countries after Barack Obama was elected. But the, it, the deflation is such that people are saying, it just doesn't get better. They still like him but they've lost confidence in America to be able to change because nothing happened to make it better. And so this Arab Spring, as President Obama noted, we didn't start it, we can't lead it, and we can't direct it. A little bit of humility is in order here. Um, and knowing that the region has changed, our ability to relate to that region has changed, and, um, and the things that we can do are very different than sometimes the things we would like to do. Um, you're on the right path, most of Washington's not, in terms of how we can relate. And the point is, can we change the culture? Um, I, I don't know if we can, or better I'd say, I'm not sure how long it will be before we can, but I know that I'm with you in rolling this stone, and we'll just keep working at it. And I thank you very much.